All right, what about automotive systems? So automotive systems are another interesting area um, of cyber cybersecurity that you might uh, you know be interested about. So automotive electronics is a huge area, right? This is like an example of various electronic systems in a car. And you have obvious ones like the engine control, right? So that's an electronic system. Uh, but more and more stuff now is pushed into even a, a very basic car. So if we don't talk about like a Tesla that has you know, self-driving features and tons and tons of more things, even your sort of run-of-the-mill standard car um, that, you know, maybe 20, 2010 or newer for sure, uh, but even some older cars have quite a bit of, of electronics in them, right? Because they'll definitely have engine controllers. Um, they'll definitely have stuff like um, entertainment systems, right? So that doesn't have to be a super fancy entertainment system, even if it has... Um, you know, some of them will support like satellite radio and things with external communication interfaces, but uh, even a fairly basic one tends to be integrated into a car. Um, a lot of cars will have tire pressure monitoring now, anti-lock brakes, basically everything would have. Um, you might have features like, you know, blind spot detection and stuff like that. Um, remote keyless entry and security features and all that stuff is all part of um, the electronics of this car. So there's tons of electronics in even a moderately recent um, car. So if you're looking at automotive systems, safety is normally the first requirement. So ahead of um, security, we're normally looking at making sure these systems remain safe. Um, they have some level of cost consideration. So uh, it may surprise you, you know, that you think ah, cars are a very expensive device. Surely they're not that cost constrained. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a consumer electronic right there. Uh, making tons, you know, millions and millions of, of uh, vehicles, even a moderately popular car. Um, they often will reuse parts across many models. Uh, so you're really looking to save costs as much as you can. So typically the electronic units do what they need to do and not a whole lot more than that. Um, the devices also have a very long lifespan. So this will be an important one because, you know, a, you might keep a car for five to 15 years often. Um, lots of cars are older than that out there, but you know, most of the time you're at least in that range. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, if one person has it, they sell it on. So like a typical car is gonna stay around for a while. Um, and when you have this module reuse as well, you start to see that, you know, there's a huge amount of designs that are specified five years ago that are still um, on the road now, that may still be being sold. Um, and this, the development of that, right? So the start of the design was years before that. So you can see there's this huge lag between state of the art and end of life in automotive. So that's another really important consideration. Um, so here's an example of a slightly older, this is a 2006, uh, I think, or 2005 uh, model year uh, ECU photo that I took. Um, and when I say ECU, this is either electronic control unit um, or uh, you may also see it called engine control unit. Um, so normally the electronic control unit means, you know, any of the electronic controllers in the car, or any of these little computers. Um, the engine control unit is actually dealing with the main functions of the engine. You can see there's like a main microcontroller running code. Um, and there's also some other, this one has at least, you know, two, because for safety reasons, there tends to be some self-checking and, and stuff like that. So um, these would be, if you look at the IoT side, right, these are not running Linux or anything like that normally. Um, these types of ones are running either, uh, some small RTOS most likely, right? So it's, it's normally going to be designed for safety critical applications. Um, so there's some special constraints around automotive electronics. Um, but from the, you know, side of what are the, the access points to it, what are the vulnerabilities, um, it's going to be in that range of, you know, a fairly low number of communications interfaces, um, but they may not be as well tested. Um, so as a really good example of that, here's like um, uh, in 2015, there was this pretty cool demo where uh, some researchers actually showed that they could attack a number of Jeep and other vehicles remotely. Um, and so there's a video where they actually, you know, are wirelessly initially just connecting to the car and later wirelessly connecting to the car to sort of kill the engine, kill the brakes um, while someone's in it. And how were they able to do this? 
Um, so there's a white paper here with this title, Remote Exploitation of an Unaltered Passenger Vehicle. Um, and it's quite, you know, again, like in real life, these get quite complex. Um, but what you basically have is you had the engine control unit, right? So um, there's a controller um, on one network um, and it also can talk to uh, the radio. So it was on the same network as the radio, um, which was also on the same, a, a different network uh, with the, this brake control module on it. Um, so you basically had these multiple networks, right, in a car. Um, and through the radio system, they were able to rewrite some of these various um, other modules. And by rewriting the code on them, uh, you could actually do stuff like they showed in the video. And the radio module was pretty interesting um, because it also had a, a always on connection. So the real issue here was uh, these cars support, you know, some of the safety features where you can press a button um, like OnStar and similar, and it connects over a GSM network, you know, to someone, so, or a cellular network, really, not just GSM, um, for someone to talk to. As part of that, um, it knows the location of the vehicle and things like that, and even without people enabling that feature, uh, they were able to find the location of vehicles and then, you know, hack into them via the interface. So, so there's quite a bit of, of stuff you can do in these types of, of uh, devices, right? And the point... Uh, to this as well is that yes, there weren't many interfaces available, um, but the interfaces that were available didn't have, you know, they had a number of issues in them that allowed them to perform this, this work. Um, if you're interested in it, just some really quick resources. Uh, there's a really good book, The Car Hacker's Handbook. Um, so this will go over a lot of background about how does automotive electronics work? How would you do your own uh, setup? You know, a few examples of it. Um, if you are interested in automotive, I recommend this and there's a physical book or you can even get a, a free PDF book uh, as well from the author. So um, There's more car hacking resources out there. So there's a lot of really good resources. Um, if you're ever at uh, some events, there's normally um, it's this thing called Car Hacking Village. So this is at DEF CON. Um, and it's now at a few other events as well. Uh, but if you go to the website, you can see, you know, whenever events happen again, um, the chance to, to see some of this in person. So at these types of events, you can see cool stuff like, you know, here you can see all the parts of a car have sort of been ripped out and put up onto a, a board so that you can access everything without having to have a car right there. Um, so there's lots you can do with this type of car hacking stuff. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's an interesting area. A little different from IoT and a little different from other areas, but if you're interested in it, um, I do recommend you know ch checking some of those resources out and seeing you know what you can actually get started with on your own.